Assalamu alaikum, good morning, khuyamorecho, bonjour. Welcome to Well This Morning. You are watching which is a Hashmi after almost four days, I guess. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I've been sick. I'm pretty sure you can tell by the quality of my voice as well. I've been bedridden, but a lot of you have been sending me wishes and prayers. Thank you so much for that. That is why I'm here with you back again with my show Well This Morning on a Friday morning. But I think the last day of the week does not deserve such a mellow start. I mean, talking about sickness and viral thingies and whatnot. So let's talk about something exciting. And talking of exciting, Pakistan has just opened PSL. And yesterday was the first match between, I think, Islamabad and, uh, you know, uh, Koita Gladiators, was it? I'm not pretty sure about that. But today we're going to have two matches between Multan and Karachi and another between Lahore and Koita as well again. And speaking of sports, you know, a lot of schools um, venture into extracurricular activities like sports, like paintings, like gymnastics and whatnot for a better mental health of the students of their, you know, schools. And a lot of parents support the idea as well. But before we move on to what we're talking about today, I have mentioned about this, you know, extracurricular activities because a lot of schools in Islamabad especially are lately having open days or sports galas where a lot of different fun activities are arranged for students and their parents to come to schools and enjoy along with each other. So we have a small package for you guys that our team went out and made from one of the schools here in Islamabad. Take a look at it and then we will discuss about it. Here you go. Healthy body makes a healthy mind. How often have we heard that and taken it for granted? But this school in the federal capital, Islamabad, took the quote quite seriously and arranged an open day for all its students to enjoy extracurricular activities with their fellows and parents. Some of the activities on the itinerary were storytelling, sandwich making, skeleton dance, along with a beautiful display of gymnastics. Days like these open up a child's mind to many possibilities and boosts the morale. Curricular and co-curricular, if blended in a perfect balance, can teach discipline, mannerism, ethics and leadership to kids. I like teachers. I like to do activities. My school is beautiful. I love my teachers and my friends. I am a kite. I love to rise high. Again, the wind. We spoke to some of the parents and their energetic kids on the occasion and asked how they were enjoying it. This open day house is very effective, like uh, it boosts confidence in students. Being a parent, it's a great feeling to be the part of city school. Uh, it's all about uh, activity based learning. I'm really satisfied. I'm just so happy to see things around which are going on and open house activities was just amazing. Mental math competitions, science experiments and spring phonic walk were held to encourage students to learn it with fun and be more inquisitive about nature and science. Such activities promote learning for the kids. Through this open day, we get a chance to depict that we work really hard on our children and we display the activities and the fun parts along with the academics we do in the school. We provided great opportunity to our students to uh, come and perform in curricular and extracurricular activities. Zumba was performed more like a flash mob where the participants practiced effective fitness and healthy living. If similar events are organized in all schools, the students' productivity rate and mental and physical health can be improved to surreal levels. Well, this was interesting to look at. And you know, when you are talking about learning, I think it's not only related to books, your syllabi, your textbook, because of course it gets boring for the students, yes, but you have to make the mind healthy as well, along with the uh, extracurricular activities that we talked about. And in line with that, actually today, we have someone in our studio who actually chose to study something that is so interesting to look at, that is so colorful to look at. She studied arts, ladies and gentlemen. She happens to be a painter and she is here on our show all the way from Paris. She's been living there for a very long time, almost 30 years. And she's in Islamabad for almost two weeks now. We will talk to her about her, you know, stay in Pakistan, how she's liking it, and also specifically why she's here. Just to give a little bit away, she's here for an arts exhibition, which is called Imaginary Scenes, the Oriental Influence. What is it about? What are all the, you know, pieces that she's painted about? We will definitely ask her in person, also show you as well and ask her what they mean. So on my right hand side, ladies and gentlemen, we've been joined by Wendy Billingsley. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Bonjour. 
Thank you, Roland. Hello, Shiza. Thank <laughs> you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. How are you? I'm very, very well, thank you. So we just had a little conversation before the show as well. So we've been, you know, hanging before time as well. And we've talked about her paintings and whatnot, what inspires her. But for you, all of you out there, Wendy, to begin with, as a child, you know, let's go back in time. Of course, we need to talk about the exhibition, but I want people to find out more about you as a painter as well. Mm -hmm. So did you always have a knack of painting? I mean, uh, I think you already said to me, you know, earlier that every child knows how to draw or paint. Give them a paper and a pen and they put something on the paper, anything out of their mind. Mm -hmm. But were you always good with images in your mind? Uh, yes, I think so. They were always coming. I found myself drawing very frequently as a child with all kinds of uh, colors around me and all kinds of pictures. Mm. And I just continued and it's sort of, um, when it comes so naturally, something that comes to you so naturally, um, and actually people were amazed, uh, my teachers and adults were amazed at what I was drawing and always said, how could you, um, of course as a child you don't understand how they could be amazed, but then because of this encouragement and of the compliments that I received and because it was coming so naturally, I, I really thought that this was um, important to recognize and to develop. And you know, so they say that artists and painters happen to be sensitive as well. You know, they're very sensitive in terms of nature, in terms of how they feel about things. Are you a sensitive person and do you bring that to your work as well? Well, I think definitely you need to be sensitive in order to make um, a good piece of work. It's actually difficult to make a really good piece mm -hmm. of art. I think anyone can, children, you know, they can paint and draw, but then to get to a point where you consider your, in your own mind something to mm. be actually valuable to yes and and actually successful and good you need to use all of your sensitivity right. to to judge and feel and pay attention to all the details and all your influences to really put right. um, more than 100 percent into each work so what did you study I studied fine arts I studied fine arts okay. in um, Paris and a bit in New York wow. and also in London at Central St. Martin's. So especially when you're living in a city like Paris, it's so beautiful. You must be getting inspirations every other day, right? And then, you know, you might have a lot of ideas to put on paper and you might be, you know, conflict among them as well. Maybe this one is right, maybe this one is not. How do you get, you know, away with, with all those conflicts in your head? must be so hard. Susa, that is a really good question because <laughs> there are so many ideas that um, could come about that could influence us. How do we know what is the right work mm -hmm. and where to focus our attention when? And um, I draw, I make drawings and um, I listen to my feelings uh, from inside and actually sometimes you really know what is most important after thinking for a while, sometimes in the evening thinking about things, you will realize what is actually the most important thing. Because when we make a work of art or a painting, mm. we are asking people to give their attention to something. Right. We are focusing our own attention as artists mm. to make it, but in the end, what we're going to show the world, yeah. we really want people to pay attention to this thing. So it really needs to be um, a specific choice and it needs to be something that we feel is really important. Right, but Wendy, doesn't it bother you that maybe something that you've drawn, it means something to you, but the viewer, or if I were to see it, it maybe doesn't mean as much to me or maybe I don't even understand what you're trying to tell me. Doesn't it bother you? No. Not at all, really. Because I've, I mean, you're because okay. it's otherwise. If you if you want to make um, in painting, it has to be what the individual spectator mm. feels when they look at it and what they think. Because the spect you're giving the possibility to the spectator to actually develop their own sensitivity and their own emotions and right. their own inner dialogue. When you go to a museum, for mm. example, mm. and when you see a. Uh, ancient um, things, you have beautiful things here in Pakistan. Doesn't everyone have um, their own feeling about it? Some people like this um, pottery and some people like this um, type of painting, this type of um, textiles. Everyone has their own feeling. If you want to say something yeah. um, that's more directed, then you need to perhaps um, write a report, write a book, make a documentary mm. film, mm. or make a series of documentary photographs. If you want to say a specific message, you probably wouldn't do painting. You wouldn't do painting. Okay, so you've been in Pakistan for two weeks now, mm -hmm. and you have visited uh, what other cities other than, you know, other than Islamabad? I know, but for the viewers out there, tell them. Um, I had the pleasure of visiting Multan. Wow, Multan. <laughs> and uh, Balawapur. 
Bahawalpur yes. at Multan. And they're culturally so rich. You must have enjoyed the architecture over there. I was really amazed. I love it. We saw many um, beautiful tombs. Wow. Uh, yes, and visited mosques. I was um, really impressed. Also in Balwapur, we saw um, the library and wow. actually visited the zoo. Uh, the zoo as well. <laughs> yes. Did you draw inspiration from the things that you saw there in Multan in Bahawalpur? Definitely, definitely. And are you going to paint about them in the future maybe? Yes, I certainly. <laughs> I have this intention. Yes. Okay, perfect. So we will talk about, you know, the exhibition that you're holding in Islamabad, the reason why you're here. But we have some pictures uh, from your exhibition, your paintings actually. Can we have them on screen and then we, maybe you can tell us what they are about? Sure. Mm, you know, just waiting for my team to play them on the screen. And then we can, maybe I can tell you what I decipher. Okay, what is this? So this painting is called Smoker's Bus, What You okay. Really Need. I painted it while I was living in London. It is a um, London double-decker bus. Yeah. And the scene takes place in winter's night. The days are very short and dark right. in um, London in the winter. Mm. And so there is a lot of advertisements okay. about... Okay. Um, vacation places so what you see at the top that looks like blue sky you see a palm tree on the right some water these are actually billboard advertisements for um holidays weekend holidays oh, okay. uh, you know something um flights to the south of spain or f uh, flights to um places oh, that you perfect. can go and what to. about this one you add a lot of colors right you love being colorful <laughs> the colors well painting is about colors yeah, right? right i think of we course. could not really paint in just black so what about white. this one? Does it have a specific meaning or something that probably I'm missing? Can we have it again that Wendy can explain to us, please? So on the left there was the pineapple. Okay. This is okay. ananas. And I understand in Pakistan you also say ananas. Yes. Right? <laughs> this is the French word. They are so beautiful. I love them. Um, you look so closely. Them. You see so many different colors and designs. Hmm. But this ananas is similar to the word for um, a girl in French, Nana, is kind of a, oh, okay. a nickname for short term for a girl. So there is a woman underneath, you can see like a model, right. and you hmm. see a shadow of a photographer taking oh, the picture okay. of this ananas, Nana, so it's a woman, pineapple. Okay, makes and sense, makes on, sense. So on are the, these, on are the these going to be available in the exhibition as well? Yes, these are available. The um, images look um, not true to their proper scale, maybe a little bit... Um, widened for the screen just to let the viewer mm -hmm. know. They may maybe. be pixelated as well, mm. but of course we can yes. get a better picture of sure. it at, at the exhibition, ladies and gentlemen. We will ask her where it is and of course you can go and find out about it. Oh wow, beautiful. Did you, did you, is this sort of related to the Louvre Museum as yes, well? Yes, exactly. Wow, There's yeah, a yeah, Lama right. suit. <laughs> there is um, sort of a, it's a winged um, angel. Right. Um, uh, Lamassu, they're called, and they uh, come from um, Kurzabad, uh, mm. which is um, now uh, in present-day Iraq, but um, from a temple that oh. was built in um, in the end of the eighth okay. century before our era. Oh wow, perfect. So maybe since you have already visited Multan, I feel like in the future we're going to have paintings from Wendy of the tombs in Multan as well. Yes, of course, we're looking forward to that. But since we talked about Louvre Museum, mm -hmm. you know, it's just last year, I think we already talked about it before the show as well, but last year, um, Beyonce and Jay-Z produced a song inside the Louvre Museum and that was when I started to learn about arts over there. A lot of artists draw inspiration from paintings, like Donald Grover made, uh, you know, a song, This Is America. There were a lot of culture and painting references over there. And then there's Pink Floyd, We Don't Need No Education, that is, you know, as well. Do you draw inspiration from musicians or probably films or songs as well in your paintings? Does it go vice versa, that, like they draw inspiration from your work? Maybe you can draw from theirs. Sure, sure. I mean, we, I think we have inspiration from almost everything we see. Um, uh, I would prefer actually going to the opera hmm. um, and then to maybe pop music, but um, I'm inspired. I think we're all influenced by everything around us, aren't right. we? So maybe I wouldn't say that I would be directly inspired from hmm. um, from listening to music. I often prefer to work in my studio in, in quiet. Hmm. Just so the noise of the you. birds around. Oh, okay, quite works for you as well. So mm. you must be really enjoying in Islamabad because it happens to be the most peaceful city of Pakistan with beautiful view as well, right? Beautiful view, and we went. Uh, I had the privilege of walking in the Margala Hills oh, wow. and going up, and really love the the scenery, the landscape. It's so beautiful. Yeah. 
Okay, perfect. So we have a small trailer of a French movie, although, okay, we'll get back to that in a bit, but I have a question for you. So about your exhibition, this mm. is specifically about the Central Asia and the Orient times and whatnot. Tell us about it. It's called The Imaginary Scenes, Oriental Influence. What does that mean? What is it all about? Who are the people that should be coming to see your work? Tell us about it. Well, the exhibition is at the Kamsatz University Islamabad Gallery, okay. which um, I think you can find Kamsatz yeah, University. Yeah, definitely. Um, and the choice uh, I made when I was invited here to Islamabad, um, I made the choice of over 100 paintings of the images that had um, already Oriental influences, and this is coming mm. from our, our, the collective unconscious, I would say, or right. just everyone's mind. We all have some images or some ideas of what is Orient from stories, from films, mm. from from um, the history that we've read. From history, yeah. yes. So uh, the paintings that I chose were um, really belong here. I feel really needed to come here and belong mm. here, and they have many different uh, little references to the subcontinent of Asia and um, stories that are. Um, a genie on a flying carpet oh, wow. and um, uh, veiled figures of people in uh, different um, suggesting things that are definitely oriental and from Asia. Oh, perfect, perfect. So it's very relevant to the people over here as well, right? Because they can relate to it, of course. But I have some very interesting questions to ask Wendy over here. Um, she, is, she already mentioned that she is sensitive. She also mentioned to me before the show that she connects to the nature in a very spiritual way, and actually everyone does. Nature constantly, you know, sends signs to you. You just have to sort of catch the signs and embark on the beautiful journey. But let's take a look at this small uh, trailer from a French movie that's called Seraphine. This girl happens to be a painter. After we've watched this, then we are back with Wendy with some more questions. Let's take a look. Je peux savoir qui a peint ça Séraphine, à la nôtre. Vos toiles sont très belles. Vous en avez d'autres Vous n'allez pas passer votre vie à faire le ménage alors que, que vous avez le lord dans les mains. Vous ne m'avez jamais dit qu'est-ce qui vous a donné envie de peindre. J'aime le petit secret. Et là-dedans, tout va bien, Séraphine Aussi quand je le regarde, j'ai peur de ce que j'ai fait. This was Seraphine for you, ladies and gentlemen, and this is probably based on a true story. And Wendy over here has actually watched the movie, and you happen to know about it. Did you enjoy watching it because this happens to be about a painter? Uh, you were telling me she happens to be a servant as well. Go on. Uh, that uh, film is uh, about, uh, it's based on a true story. It's about a woman who was working as a, as a cleaner and um, um, a servant in a house, but she would paint in her own free time, and it's a really brilliant funny, um, moving film. It's been a while since I saw it, but I would recommend it if people can see it. Of that. course, of course. So. And I would definitely watch it because it seems soft as well with the motion as well, mm. you know. So yes, uh, about the thing that I wanted to talk to Wendy. So just yesterday when she sent in her information, there was this one thing. She mentioned that uh, she was probably riding a bike or something and this idea of a landslide came to your mind. That's right. And then you found it very sort of necessary to put it on paper. Mm -hmm. and that moment probably you did not realize it was a sign or something but later on you felt like it was a sign of the nature to you tell us about it the whole story because it is very interesting to see well um yes i was uh, on my bicycle in paris i ride a bicycle almost everywhere i was uh, coming home and i had a real strong feeling a vision in my mind of this island that was falling falling in the sand and the land was caving in and moving in all around an ocean with the water pouring down a huge wave right, coming right. in and all kinds of plants trees kind of um, an island moving mm. in on itself uh, the land moving in so i 
I really had the image was so clear in my mind. It was strange. It was really striking. So As I had to stop. I stopped on my bicycle and I went to a cafe and I, I took out a piece of paper and drew down really what I saw because it felt unusually strong. Normally I'm not um, struck with such. It has happened before, but mm. it's not always that uh, strong. And right. so I went to went to my studio and started working on that that painting um, and stopped what I was doing and worked on that painting right away because I felt it was something so important but of course I didn't understand and that was uh, in 2011 and in, in February 2011 and then in early March um, it was the tsunami that occurred in Japan a very bad uh, tsunami mm. Uh, we heard about Fukushima. Yes, of course. It, it's sort of you remember. already had a preconceived notion of what was going to happen. I don't know because it didn't have. I don't know. I can't really say that at all. But um, I, I, I thought afterward, how could that? How could I have such a strong feeling and mm -hmm. see this big wave and island and 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 things kind of collapsing and then have this huge event occur mm -hmm. and then also seeing images of the event? Well, maybe. You know, maybe we we could have these kind of premonition of course, feelings. Why of course. not? We are, we are a part of this planet, of course, right? We are connected to nature in so all sorts of uh, forms and things and whatnot. We, uh, you know, conceive signs that we've already talked about. But thank you so much, Wendy, for being here. It was so nice to be in conversation with you. You're such a brilliant soul even to talk to. And the work that I've seen of yours, I absolutely love it. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to see Wendy's work, she's come all the way here to share her oriental influence work with you. The exhibition is called Imaginary Scenes. It is happening in the Comsets Art Gallery right now. So please don't miss out on it. It is going to be amazing, I promise you. Well, we are now headed out to a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk about something different. Stay tuned. Good morning.
Welcome back to World This Morning with Shaza Hashmi today on a Friday morning. Ladies and gentlemen, all of those who are going to offer their Jummah prayers today, please remember me and your team in your prayers as well. But today happens to be the World Hippo Day. Did you know about it? I did not. Hippopotamuses or hippos happen to be the third largest land mammal on the planet. That is insane, but they're also so cute to look at. I think we have a small clip of them over here playing in the mud. Then we can look at it and speak about it as well as it happens to be the Hippo Day. It's interesting because I didn't even know we have a specific day for them. I mean, you didn't know, I'm pretty sure, that Hippo loosely translates to river horse in ancient Greek. Hippo Day celebrates the third largest mammal, as I've already mentioned. And what they usually do is, you know, take some time out to waddle in mud bath, get angry with some tourists around them and yawn a lot while opening their mouth very widely. I think a small baby can actually fit in their mouth. It opens them so wide, but they're so cute to actually look at. Dirty, muddy, yes, of course, but also so cute. Um, we have some hippos in, uh, in zoos in Pakistan as well, in Islamabad, in Lahore, of course. Um, love celebrating this day with them. Okay, so this was World Hippo Day, ladies and gentlemen, but this has actually nothing to do with what we're talking about right now. So on my right hand side, I've been joined by someone who happens to train and teach people in the businesses and also sort of, you know, uh, tell them how to increase their work productivity, work efficiency as well. And he makes a good teamwork. He, you know, teaches them how to be good leaders and how to actually practice what they have, not practice yet to achieve the greater results in their businesses, in their organizations. He has trained more than 73,000 people from different organizations. This is Ibrahim Ahmed, who also happens to be an entrepreneur. Hello, assalamu alaikum. How are you? I am good. Thank you for having me here. You know, it's absolutely our pleasure. So to begin with, you yourself happen to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. So all the things that you teach out there to the people, is it because of your experience? Have you learned all of these or are these, you know, just out of a book, a textbook probably. Uh, so yeah, it's a, I think it's a blend of two, uh, both. Uh, hmm. Not exactly a textbook, but a lot of the technology advancements that we see these days. Right. Uh, other than that, it's a lot of personal experience. I mean, uh, it took me about good three to four years to understand some basic concepts hmm. because I was doing pr practical things. Uh, also, on the other hand, I'm trying to help people so they don't have to waste that much time so they can right. get basic information. And now it's not just me. There are a lot of people doing a lot of great things. A lot yes. of platforms are there. Uh, one of them is obviously NIC is the National Incubation Centers yes. all across Pakistan mm -hmm. in the provincial capitals and the federal. Mm. Uh, that's under the Ministry of IT. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, and they're trying to work with, uh, you know, to uplift entrepreneurial ecosystem. Right. And then there's other forums, Tri, Islamba, and I mean, there are a lot of things, a lot of mm. platforms that are mm. tr trying to nurture the new entrepreneurs so they don't have to yes. go through the same grind like we did. Of course. Okay. And you know, talking about entrepreneurship, so I was reading in, a, in an article by Pro Pakistan, this was from 2017, <coughs> and it mentioned that, um, you know, a lot of people are venturing into businesses, especially fresh graduates, you know, they're so passionate about what they want to do. But 50% of the businesses that they start five years down the lane, they are not even existent anymore. Why okay. is that so? Okay, so I think that's probably not the correct report because globally 97% mm. businesses uh, this die This was about in Pakistan. Okay. This was about Pakistan okay. specifically. Uh, okay, so globally 97% businesses die in the first three years of their uh, oh. launch okay. uh, because they, they indulge themselves in the fixed recurring cost. Mm. Uh, for example, even when you ask someone if they want to start a business, so what are the costs? I mean, a lot of people come and they say we need 1 million, 2 million to start a business and we're like, okay, why you need it for? Uh, so the major cost is a op fixed operational cost and a recurring cost. Uh, they want uh, office at the let's just say 11th floor in the in the premium building uh, mm -hmm. with a good infrastructure with right. have 10 15 people mm -hmm. working under them and they want to when walk into the room everyone says hi good morning you know to right. the boss mm -hmm. so they're like we need about a million for that as well so you know mm -hmm. so the purpose is not there and they don't know why they are doing what they are doing the goal is not clear to them exactly is mm -hmm. secondly the uh, the main problem is uh, uh, so th there's a, this concept of bootstrapping where you have to start with minimum resources uh, and to generate enough re revenue so you can mm. go big and you can scale. Okay. Uh, so a lot of it comes from there and then the, in my personal opinion the major problem is their mindset because they mm. think 
uh, putting up a CEO at abc.com on their Facebook profile will make them an entrepreneur, make them which an is entrepreneur. not the case, which is also, not the you case, know, yeah. Also, recognized socially as well, you know, you happen to yeah, be an entrepreneur. Yeah, so, so it, I mean, it takes, uh, it takes your sweat and tears, it, it, it's a lot more than that, just, uh, it's not just about your social media profile. Definitely. Right? So a lot of people are not willing to put in that hard work. Hmm. Uh, as one of my mentors would say, if you work more for less, uh, money, mm. uh, then very soon you have to work less for more money. We call mm. it call it experience. Okay. So and if you have the same mentality, okay, you'll get up around 10 a.m. in the morning and you'll be done with the with your work by mm. three. Uh, okay. And you are an entrepreneur and you'll make a lot of money. You won't. You're right. And you know, Mr. Ibrahim, uh, since we've already mentioned that a lot of fresh graduates want to venture into entrepreneurship. They have ideas, but sometimes the ideas they're only passionate about, they're not, they're not really feasible in terms of business, right? Yeah. I mean, the market does not need them, but they want to execute it because it's in their head. They're yeah. passionate about it. How do you tell them that, you know what, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but this is not going to happen? Okay, so uh, I think my burst, uh, bubble was burst back in 2016. Uh, when I was attending a training as a participant in LAMP, then there was this person who came from Silicon Valley, uh, and he, he he gave a very interesting insight, and now I preach it. Okay. And he said uh, he he said a lot of people tell you that Silicon Valley has Google, Facebook, you know, and all the big giants, Apple, Samsung, uh, but this is but what people or the media is not telling you is that Silicon Valley also happens to be the graveyard of business ideas. Mm, Never right. ever fall in love with your business idea. Okay. Uh, because when you fall in love with a business idea, you tend to ignore all the feedback that's coming to you. Hmm. Because you think you know it and it's all in your head, that's, that's how it should be done and you do it that way and no one wants to buy it. You get too rigid about it, it right? Too, it's too rigid. So hmm. uh, you should be passionate about your idea and the idea is about serving others because they will get to use your product or service, right? Hmm. You are hmm. there to help people. Uh, so one way of validating your idea is to go and speak to your customers and hence the concept of design thinking which is about, uh, which talks about putting customer or your end user at the heart of whatever you are doing. Of course, it should yeah. be a two-way process, right? Yeah. You really need to sort of venture into the market because you need to know what they're talking yeah. about. So there's this really funny thing. Um, every now and then, this picture comes up on the internet. There are, uh, you know, heels, shoes, of course, yeah. but the heels are in the front, not at the back. Yeah. And it's so funny to look at because who is ever going to buy that? It's so even hard to even walk in well, shoes yeah. that have heels in the front. Yeah. So, you know, business is like these. I mean, it's an idea in your head that cannot be actually executed yeah, with the so, clients. Yeah, so again, one of the things that I learned from my mentors, he said, uh, t take interest in life and people. Hmm. If you take interest in these two things, uh, you'll be good to go be. And the best thing is there is life all around you and there are 7 billion people in the world. And see what problem they are facing. Hmm. Help them elevate that problem and that's your business idea. Right. For example, all the inventions that we are seeing in this room from tube light to sofas to, to you know, these tables and these cameras is everything. It was someone's invention because people uh, was in the pain. They wanted to record. They wanted to have an experience. They wanted right. to have a lighting. Uh, so and someone did it so i mean if you pick any one random thing about which i mean which makes people in pain you help them elevate that pain and you, there's your business idea i mean yeah. for example uh, because of the security issues that we see in Pakistan, have you, have you ever imagined the, how big the market of our security uh, guards companies is, the CCTV cameras, you right. know, the security equipments, uh, and the, because of the dust and the environment that we live in, we, I mean, these shampoos, these face wash, hand mm. wash, and so many things. And so that's all an opportunity. We, we had a worse load shedding in the past few years, hence the business boom for the generator people and mm. the UPS people, right? right. So every, op every problem is an opportunity opportunity depends how you t take it hmm. but if hmm. I want to take every op a problem as an opportunity only when if it suits me right. in the time that hmm. suits me and it will bring me more money with minimum effort then hmm. I'm sorry I have to shut down <laughs> my business at any point in time okay that makes sense yeah. but you know Mr. Ibrahim um, things are sort of different now I mean earlier when you had to start a business uh, you're right you had to do market research what not you have to have a lot of capital to invest in to begin with but because of, you know, um, the ease of internet and social media, a lot of micro businesses are also in progress, yeah. you know. You literally just have to have probably fifteen to 20,000 to start something, make a page and put up pictures of what you want to sell. And there's a whole market to cater to that. Yeah. Isn't that amazing as well? It's super amazing, uh, but the worst thing is how we use it. I mean, I mean, uh, I don't want to name the brands, but there are a lot of organizations, a lot of platforms, a lot of e-commerce stores that shows you something else and sends you something else. So oh, it's all about course. it's it's a lot about credibility. 
A, mm. but yes, the opportunity is there. I mean, the best part, is, best thing is, I mean, if you if you are doing something really well here, and you put up it or put it up on social media, and and someone is living abroad and he or she sees it, and they can order it right there and then, right? right? The problem is especially for micro enterprises because I work with both ends of the spectrum. I work with the high growth, high impact startups and the mm. uh, micro enterprises okay. who are at the bottom of the pyramid. Okay. The problem is the uh, quality assurance. Uh, for example, if you go to the southern Punjab side or the Sind or in KP where the women make a lot of cultural uh, dresses, mm. you know, shawls and uh, bed sheets, etc. Mm. Mm. Uh, if you ask them to make 10 for you, they'll make great. Okay. But if you ask them to make 100, they won't be able to do hmm. that because the standardization is missing. Hmm. Uh, so I recently got to know, you know, the world's biggest impo exporter of uh, honey is Germany. Wow. Right? Hmm. And the world's biggest importer of honey is also Germany because okay. they import from all the world, hmm. they standardize it and send it back to the world. And wow. we are like, oh, I've got this uh, honey from Germany. You know, right. that's smart actually yeah. to think about it. It's yeah. actually so really I, smart. So, so, so in micro enterprises cases, I mean, they are more committed to the cause and the passion they are working hmm. for. Uh, we, I, I'm, I've recently become part of this program that's, uh, that's about social and creative enterprises. It's uh, developing inclusive uh, creative economies. And the program is all about uh, teaching social and creative entrepreneurs, mm. uh, helping them, uh, you know, increase their business acumen because the problem is they might be great at what they do. I mean, they would be great at mm. painting or making things, producing things, product design, great, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, social uh, uh, entrepreneurs, they would be great at creating an impact. They had, might have a communities, right. but they may not have a strong business sense. So there's the concept of having a co-founder with you because if I'm good at what we produce, hmm. then I need someone who's good at managing business. But you know, Mr. Ibrahim, you're absolutely right. I have so much to talk about, but we short on time, so very quickly two questions. Um, you know, um, since we're talking about entrepreneurship, you are, when you start a business of your own, it's your brainchild. You're sort of entirely married and committed to your business. You yeah. don't have time to socialize or to, you know, give time to your family or to have fun at all. How can we strike the right balance to have a, you know, fit mental health as well and yeah. then to focus on your business as well? Okay, so I, I so the, for me, the challenge is to prioritize things. I hmm. mean, what's important versus what's urgent. Uh, and at the same time, it's very important to understand whom you are hanging out with. I mean, what's, who is in your social circle? For me, I have a social circle uh, who supports me with my business. Then there's a social circle who supports me, uh, who supports me with my business, uh, my training, the work that I okay, do. Okay. And then there are my friends who help me with life. So, you know, I have people who help me with life, then who give me technical expertise. Hmm. So you can exchange ideas. Uh, so, I mean, so... A, you need to have these kind of seg segregated uh, segments where right. you go and meet them. Okay. Then it's very important. The problem is, so you are so much into your business that you have you are thinking about it. You sleep with the idea. You get up with the hmm. idea. So you tend to ignore everything. Hmm. Uh, and that's not by choice. That's an unconscious effort hmm. in most cases. Hmm. So the idea is to see uh, what kind of a person am I becoming in pursuit of what I want. Hmm. I mean, uh, and. And whom I, I, I'm hanging around with, because as they say, you be, we become an average person of those five individuals with whom we spend most of our time. Most of the time, okay. Right, so we need to pick those people, right? I mean, when we friends sit together, because we have so we travel a lot, we work with the humans a lot, mm. because we have a lot of human interaction going on. So we need our time as well. Where we sit, we just crack jokes, we laugh at each other, and we kind of refuel our energies. Mm. And that comes from in interacting with your loved ones. I mean, my favorite Definitely. example is on the day one of Eid, mm. why everyone is so happy? Because a lot of hugs and kisses are being exchanged. Right. That, that releases a lot of neurons in your mind. You mm. know? That's a basic uh, uh, your mind right. science, right? Right, right? So we need to, the, and the thing that replace this human touch, the, what people think is that if I can just text you, okay, how are you, I'm good, blah, 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 blah that gives you a certain uh, do, uh, dose of dopamine, but it cannot give you a certain, and it mm. cannot release oxytocin in your mind. So we need to have that physical interaction with our loved ones. And when a father walks in the, in the house after his work, and he is hugged by his kids and his uh, spouse, mm. so he releases all his tensions, you know? Right. So it's also very healthy, right? I mean, yeah. it's not also really healthy to sort of just focus on your work. I mean, you're working early in the morning, yeah. late at night, and whatnot. I know a lot of people who actually 
especially even after work, are continuously on their phones when they're sitting with their family. Yeah. Oh, I'm probably responding to my, you know, boss, probably responding to my colleagues. That's not at all healthy, right? It's not, but guilty as charged. I, <laughs> I, I do it as well. But you then do. again, but then again, it's we the need, need to prioritize. Hmm. No, we need to prioritize okay. it. I mean, okay. the conversation, if the conversation is very important, we need to put it aside. We hmm. need to, but if, if you're having this interview and I put it here or there, that means that this is more important than, than this conversation, <laughs> right? Right. So, but if you know something interesting is going on, someone needs help or you need to discuss hmm. with them. So it's, it's about time you interact with humans because the problem is at the end of the day, there is no substitute of human interaction and that brings so much out of the human and that re releases you as well. I mean, anyone who's down and out when goes out with his or her friends, hmm. why they are all charged up. So that right. should tell you something about human interaction. Wow, we thank need you to have so more much. of it. It was so good to listen to all of this, Mr. Ibrahim, especially Pleasure coming from a person who's experienced. So good to have you. Thank you so much for joining thank us. So ladies and gentlemen, towards the end, there's just one thing, you know, since we're talking about how it's so difficult, we're always on our phones, you know, working and whatnot, and it's so hard to give time to your families. I sort of understand how hard a job it is of our producers especially because they're arranging guests all the time. They're lining up the show for us, they're lining up the segments and whatnot, so I do sort of understand your pain. What my mom has started doing is actually when we ever, whenever we gather for dinner, she turns off the Wi-Fi. We're not allowed to use phones, interact with each other, and I think that's a good sign. Earlier, you know, we used to be sort of pissed yeah. because you know we need to use our phone but then I think it's a healthy activity so ladies and gentlemen if there's anything you need to write to us write us on our Facebook page with the name of well this morning on Twitter well this morning without a G daily motion on YouTube well this morning and if you have missed this show catch the repeat at 5 plus 11 p.m. tonight till the next time good morning take care Faisal Mosque is the largest mosque in Pakistan. Located in the national capital city of Islamabad. Completed in 1986,